Aloha, everyone. Um, my name is Anderson Lay. I'm the artistic director for the Hawaii International Film Festival, or HIF. Um, very honored to uh, co-present this panel uh, with the Korean Council General of Hawaii um, to present this um, Live Together virtual panel in conjunction with our free screening, virtual screening of the Oscar winning film Minati, which uh, we screened yesterday. And I want to thank A24 for allowing us to, uh, to, to pr present this film um, as a virtual screening and also, you know, free to for for people who are able to RSVP. Um, before we start, I'm you know I'm zooming in from Los Angeles, and I would like to acknowledge my presence on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Tongva people. As we convene, I also want to acknowledge Hawaii as an indigenous space of the Kanaka Oivi or Native Hawaiian, um, the first peoples of these islands. Um, Minati was nominated for six Academy Awards and garnered a historic win for Yu Jung Yun for Best Supporting Actress, a first for a Korean actor. Uh, it's a milestone in the rise of a uh, major Asian American and Pacific Islander film and TV and American mainstream media. On the opposite end of the spectrum, however, uh, we've, we've seen like a, a, a rise of anti-Asian hate sparked by the COVID-19 pandemic. Racial division and xenophobia has brought these tensions to the surface as the rise of Asian attacks in the US and around the world has become alarmingly prevalent. The story of Minati is truly an American one of an immigrant family pursuing their American dream. In this panel discussion, we explore the importance of this film, the advocacy against, um, um, a lot of advocacy against um, uh, Stop Asian Hate and the need for unity and allyship in the moral and cultural arc of quote unquote America. Uh, before we start, I'd like to introduce um, uh, Jiyun Park, uh, the Council for the Consulate General of the Republic of Korea uh, in Honolulu. Uh, I want to um, um, introduce um, Council Park and also for her cool and her support for this event. And uh, Council Park, would you like to say a few words? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jiyun Park, Council for the Republic of Korea's Consulate General in Honolulu. With May being the Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, it is all the more meaningful to invite people from different backgrounds to discuss how we can unite and live together in harmony in our country built by immigrants who came here with American dream. Uh, the United States of America, the land of opportunity is a country where anyone can dream and make their dreams come true. And I believe the greatest strength of America comes from diversity. So I would like to thank Hawaii International Film Festival for organizing this event and Mr. Lei and all the panelists for participating in this Live Together discussion. Mahalo. Thank you, Consul. Um, and just really quickly about Live Together, the Live Together campaign. Uh, hashtag Live Together Challenge was launched by UNESCO and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Korea. It's a campaign against racism and discrimination, raising solidarity and inclusion in the, in the international community to cope with hate crimes that have become more serious due to the prolonged COVID-19 pandemic. Please join the, um, the hashtag Live Together Challenge to raise awareness and end racism and discrimination and follow their Instagram uh, at live underscore together underscore campaign. Um, before we introduce our panelists, uh, we are very fortunate to have a special greeting from the director, the writer director of Minati, Lee Isaac Chung, uh, the Oscar nominated, who was Oscar nominated for, um, for obviously his film Minati. So, um, um, so we're going to play a greeting from Isaac, and and then from there we're going to start the discussion. Hi, my name is Lee Isaac Chung. I'm the writer director of Minati. I want to thank the Hawaii International Film Festival, the Korean Consulate, and for everybody involved in the uh, celebration of AAPI Heritage Month. Uh, I feel like we have a lot of work to do as a community and uh, a, a lot of uh, just efforts that we need to make to spread peace and love. So I thank you all for including Minari as part of that. And uh, I thank you for all the work that you're doing. Um, so bless you all, take care, and peace to you. All right, thank you, Isaac. Um, so uh, before we start, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Uh, David um, Sa is an attorney with Yoshida and Sa. He's a graduate of the University of Hawaii at Manoa's Rich William S. Richardson School of Law. Currently, he is the vice president of the United Korean Association of Hawaii, which serves the large Korean community in Hawaii. David, nice to meet you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Christina Moon, uh, who's our, she's a writer, strategist, and Zen priest. 
She lives and teaches at Dai Honzan Chosenji, a Rinzai Zen temple in Honolulu. She was a featured speaker at the Stop Asian Hate 808 rally that was held at the state capitol in April. Her recent article and audio commentary for Lions Roar magazine explores how Western Buddhists, Asians and allies can respond to anti-Asian violence in America by reinvesting in Asian American Buddhist institutions. Christina, welcome. Uh, Dr. Ned Schultz, uh, Professor Emeritus at, uh, at UH Manoa. He first went to Korea as a Peace Corps volunteer in 1966 after graduating from Union College in New York and lived in Busan. He received his PhD in 1976 from the University of Hawaii and he's taught at the University of Hawaii until he retired in August, 2013. At UH, he served as director for the Center for, Asian, Center for Korean Studies and later as the Dean of the School of Pacific and Asian Studies. Uh, Ned, welcome. Uh, Dr. Mary Yu Danico is an expert, expert on race relations and family, specifically Asian Americans, immigration and migration, and the diaspora as it connects to family and ethnic identity. She is a professor of sociology and the director of the Asian American Transnational Research Initiative at Cal State Cal, uh, Pal, Pomona, sorry, Cal State Pomona. Her main areas of research include international migration, ethnic and racial relations, Asian American diaspora, ethnic identity in 1.5 and second generations, immigrant families, Generations, social justice, and diaspora. So, uh, welcome, Mary. Uh, Alvin Chan uh, is an actor, playwright, director, and designer from Honolulu, Hawaii. He was an artistic associate at the Honolulu Theater for Youth from 2011 to 2018, and is a former recipient of Theater Communication Group's Fox Acting Fellowship. He holds a BA in theater from the University of Hawaii at Manoa and is currently in his last year of Northwestern University's MFA directing program. Alvin, welcome. And uh, finally, we have Serena Dunham is currently a company, company actor at the Honolulu Theater for Youth and part of the creation team of the Hawaii Way or Highway, uh, airing locally since the beginning of the pandemic. Serena is also co-founder of Bento Rakugo, a storytelling group using the tr Japanese traditional sit-down comedy form called Rakugo. Born and raised in Nara, Japan, Serena received her BA in theater at UH Manoa and has been performing in the Honolulu, the Honolulu Theater community, community ever since. So welcome Serena. Okay, so um, my first question to the panelists, and you know, just like you know, anyone can can answer is like, oh, I'm assuming you you've seen the Minati. What was your um, initial, I mean, thoughts of the film, and it's you know, what do you think of its impact, um, especially with its very you know um, illustrious uh, Oscar and award season run, and uh, many wrapping up many awards, not only for the actors but also a major, um, you know, for example, you know, it was a milestone because it was the first. Um, um, Oscar, first uh, Academy Award nominated film for Best Picture uh, with an Asian producer, you know, uh, Asian American, Korean American producer, um, with Christina Kim, and also, you know, Stephen Yun is the, you know, the first uh, uh, perhaps Asian American um, and Korean American actor uh, to be nominated for Best Actor. So, you know, it had all these milestones. So what was your initial kind of thoughts on Minati and its cultural impact? How about I, I pass along to Mary. I, I think, you know, um, aside from the beautiful cinematography and the, you know, exquisite acting by all the actors, you know, in the film, I think what I really loved about it is a really an immigrant story. And, um, you know, as a, just an, as a film, as a Korean American 1.5 generation, it was beautiful to see someone who looked like me, you know, up on screen. Um, to talk about the struggles of especially the little boy, David, and the challenges that he had just navigating and balancing the two worlds that he was exposed to, along with his Tankankra's relationship with his grandmother. Um, you know, it resonated, I think, for those of us who are immigrants to see someone who looks like us, whose experiences mirror ours, not identical, but there's just the challenges and the struggles of us trying to I don't like the word assimilation because I am not an assimilationist, but really trying to find their path and their way um, and to really survive. And I, I love the way they very softly and then sometimes overtly talked about, you know, microaggression that, that everyone faced on a daily basis. And, you know, it didn't get elevated. I, I was actually kind of waiting for some type of violent hate thing to come out. Um, it never really came up, but it was daily microaggression that the children and the family experienced. So I thought it was very smart and I, uh, it resonated really well. It was a lovely film. 
see Alvin nodding. So maybe uh, if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, piggybacking on what Mary said so greatly. Um, I mean, first of all, beautiful film made me cry multiple times as, as um, a second generation whose parents came to Hawaii from Hong Kong. Um, you know, getting to see a movie, it's not a martial arts film. It's not sci-fi fantasy. It's not about World War II, you know, it is about people trying to live and just be human. And three generations of those people and how they love each other and, and their triumphs and failures with each other. And that for me, like, was what really touched me to see that. And then, and then to see that being valued by by you know the the film industry uh, and uplifted um, is something that that we really need, yeah. Um, and so I mean, it's funny because I'm sure when Isaac wrote this, you know, it was way before all these things that are happening right now, you know. Um, but and I feel like watching it now gives me more hope than if I had seen it much earlier before the pandemic. Hmm. I think because it brought more context to the story. I mean, basically. No, well, just because of what Mary said, like it doesn't, doesn't slam anything in your face, but it does show microaggressions, whether it's yeah. well-intended or not. Right. It's like, they are there. And, but it was done very artistically and very, mm -hmm in a subtle way. Uh, I really like the lots of the, 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 the you know, the, the humanistic um, themes that are explored in the film. Um, you know, it's, you know, it is, uh, you know, a, a spiritual film, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, this is not, I mean, this is maybe just reaching, but Christina, you're a Zen priest. So like, <laughs> can you talk about kind of like, maybe the, is there any, any, you know, kind of spiritual themes or anything like that, or maybe at least humanist themes that are, uh, you know, that are, that you re may perhaps resonate with, um, with the film well i mean overtly you know the the family going to church and finding community there and then i read um an, uh, an interview with isaac where he was talking about the the neighbor paul who carries a cross down the street on sundays and that that's his church and it was really interesting he was interviewed in this one um, by this one reporter who said you know did you make that up and it was like no there was a guy in my community who did that and he had met a lot of people from the south who all knew a guy who did that and he was like a, there's an, an artistry almost in it and his expression of his faith, but um, but sort of more to, I think the, the heart of your question, Anderson, like it is a really spiritual film. And what I really saw in it as a person who trains in Zen was this attempt to really transcend the duality of self and other or American and foreign. And even some of that stuff that we get caught up in, in identity, which is such an ironic sort of statement to make during AAPI Heritage Month, where we're celebrating being our identity as Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. So it really resonates with my experience of Zen in the sense that like there are certain realities that I live with, the color of my skin and the way my face looks and the epigenetics of my ancestry. And also it, the human journey for all of us is to transcend all of that stuff that's totally impermanent and ephemeral and isn't gonna be here, isn't forever, but what is it about being human that is lasting? And I, I just really deeply appreciated that. And I think both Steven Yun and Lee Isaac Chung's attempts to make a film that was just about how hard it is to love each other. And it's not like about identity and it's not about anger, but it's about just farming and, and trying to be a family. It's interesting. Uh, when I talked to both Isaac and Steven, they, they felt like you know, they, they finally reconnect, they were able to um, connect uh, with their fathers, immigrant fathers, you know, and uh, really kind of through this film as a vehicle for them to actually you know, say, I love you and I love you back, you know? So I thought that was really, really sweet. And, um, but uh, David, I mean, your 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 your, your work as uh, you know vice president of the uh, United Association, United Korean Association of Hawaii, um, 
I mean, you you work a lot with um, you know the not only the local Korean community but also like I mean you know um, a lot of Koreans go to church, right? So um, what is I mean, how did you see the you know kind of like um, uh, representation uh, characterization of of Korean immigrant family in this film? And do you see it a lot of it um, touched upon in some kind of your own work here in Hawaii? So the film does come out as a real personal because I've, I've been there, I've experienced the same thing that they, they, David and the family has gone through. I'm a 1.5 immigrant, grew up in Korea, came to Hawaii after finishing middle school and went to high school here and raised a family with a similar background my wife is. And I mean, I mean as I see the film, it's like, that's me, that's my wife my two children and my mother who is a grandma to my two kids uh, she does the same thing as the expressions and the words that she used uh, try to calm the family situation and drama and uh, that's my mom um, so I, I looked at the film and it was like okay that's my story that's my family and like you said a lot of Korean immigrants uh, in Hawaii and elsewhere who have a similar background have gone through the same issues um, trying to just and make something out of their lives, provide for their families and next generations better opportunities. And I think that that's a struggle that, um, that David and Monica uh, was trying to say in the film. David has different values. Monica has different values for their children's success and providing comfort and uh, safe net. Um, and the grandma is there to just, you know, it's going to all work out. Um, and so I really appreciated that. And, and, and culturally, I, I think it was very important because a lot of uh, the prejudice and misunderstanding about the immigrants, uh, are, I think it's based on ignorance and on, on, on lack of awareness of where we come from, where these immigrants are coming from. And because of this exposure and, they, and, and a lot of um, the, the, you know, coverage, I think the mainstream um, Americans are now able to see that what they have been taken as granted, what they have been done, doing in form of um, you know, microaggressions, oh gosh, I, I think that it would be an opportunity for um, most people to be aware that, okay, this is how it's being seen by others, uh, by, by immigrant families. So I think it was a very impactful and very, um, you know, milestone. It is a milestone in the American uh, immigrant history. Serena, I mean, you. Oh, Gannett, you want to say something? Go ahead. Just let me interrupt just for a second because uh, I, I truly enjoyed the film too, and I also had to chuckle at how it really showed the dynamics of a Korean family, as David just alluded to. But particularly, I enjoyed the fact that the poor young girl was basically ignored. Uh, in, in in Korea, it's the son. And this was the son who took all the focus and, and the grandmother's attention. She slept with the kids. She did, you know, she really attended to him. And the poor daughter was just left there to fend for herself. And if some of you wonder why Korean women are so strong, it's because they're basically often ignored and they have time to go off and develop their character. Uh, and if you look at historically, some of the greatest writers in, in the Chosen period were women. Why? Because they were given the freedom to express themselves, whereas the poor men are forced to live into a, a certain, uh, certain pre, premeditated uh, scheme. And so David is, I mean, so, so the, the young boy is, is uh, in the process of uh, being molded and, and, and uh, molded by his grandmother. Anyway, I enjoyed that. I, and I, actually, a lot of different things that I enjoyed. The fact that it was so much was in Korean and, and what wasn't translated and what was was also very interesting. So anyway. Definitely, deli definitely deliberate choices by the director. Um, Serena, I mean, you, you are uh, you know, an immigrant yourself. You raised in Nara, Japan, and you, I believe you moved to Hawaii for, for university. Um, you know, can you talk about, um, and, you know, and also you, your, your work, um, you're, you and Alvin are both working um, you know, with the Honolulu Theater for Youth. And um, what do you see this film, especially with, um, you know, with young David as so basically kind of the main character in a way, right? It's from his perspective. Um, what do you see? How do you see this film resonate with you, or maybe with 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 young young kids? 
Sure. So I'm um, speaking for your young kids, you know, represent as you guys were talking about representation, um, what we see on the big screen. And if, if, if someone on the big screen looks like you, that's just incredible, right? It's like, wow, I can be a Hollywood star. You know, I mean, number one for any kids, I think to see someone who looks like them and also speaking in uh, not, not English. In, the, in this case, it's Korean, but speaking in your your parents' language, and you can do that and win an award. I think that representation itself is huge for for a child or you know one of us, even adults, to to see that. Um, I, I am a um, well. I, I grew up in Nara, Japan. My father is from the states. My mother is from is Japanese. So um, I am a Asian and American. I would say rather than Asian American. Um, I grew up in both countries. And I chose Hawaii to be my home. But um, yeah, the struggle of putting your roots down, you know, like the struggle of the father and the mother, you know, we belong. She wanted to be in California where she could belong with her community of the church, um, the church community there. But the father had his, his vision of life, humanity, right? I don't want to keep working he said, um, chicken sex scene, right? I don't, that's not my life. I don't want to continue to do that. But I, what I want to do is grow my, my roots really, which was farming in his, his case. But um, to see the struggle of their, their pursuing their dream while, while trying to maintain the love for their family, I think is an is a American dream, right? I think any, any ethnicity who um, migrated to the States, I mean, 10 generations ago, which was um, the Europeans, you know, anyone I think really could relate to their ancestors story in that sense too. And yeah, as um, I'm, I'm, I chose Hawaii to be my home because I am a Hapa girl. I, I would say I'd never, never really truly felt like I belonged in Japan, whereas everyone else looks like me here. Everyone's mixed. I really felt like at home here. So yeah, I, I think I, I've, planted my roots here. And speaking of um, Honolulu Theater for Youth and the work we do, so we, we've been doing a show called The Highway. It started off um, at the beginning of the lockdown during the pandemic. And our mission was to always talk about the current events that, ha that are happening around the world and also in Hawaii. So our first season uh, episodes were based on COVID-19, you know, what the heck is COVID-19, right? And we're talking to the kids. So why can't we leave our house home? Why can't I go to school? Why can't I play with my friends? So we were trying to show um, coping mechanisms, what just, or pure, just information of what is happening around the house. What, what is it that you're, why does your parents have to work, lock themselves in the office and work from home, all that. And then, um, we were actually on season three when the Atlanta um, incident happened in March 16. And interestingly enough, we were talking on an episode about bullying, anti-bullying. And we saw the news and we all unanimously said, we have to talk on this. I mean, most of our company uh, members are parts or full Asian. And, you know, I, this is happening right now. We have a platform to talk to the kids right now, let's do this. And a huge part of the discussion we had in this episode was, you know, the US continent versus Hawaii, right? I mean, the, the climate is a little different between the continent and here. And something we, um, one of the members said was, but that doesn't necessarily happen in Hawaii. You know, like the very extreme violence, I, I would say, but, um, something that our education staff shared was that there was a child in Kona, Hawaii Island, um, who was a migrant from China, who migrated just before the pandemic. And he was getting um, bullying from his classmates saying, COVID-19, don't, don't get close to me. So I would say, you know, and so we're not immune to what happens around the world. And um, we are a, you know, very popular tourist destination so many people come from all over the world. I think it's very important that the keiki here understand what is happening and to, to know how to deal with it. And yeah, to, to know what their par parents or families elsewhere are dealing with. So that's how the Stronger Together episode came about. Oh, great. 
Uh, Christina, I think you you um, recently attended a uh, Pan Asian Buddhist event in Los Angeles to mark the kind of 49 day death anniversary uh, death um, um, of um, uh, of the, the Atlanta shootings, right? Can you maybe kind of elaborate more on that that event? Well, sure. It was uh, it was really an historic event. I've never heard of so many different sects and traditions from Buddhism represented as you know in a in an indigenous Asian religion. Um, so it was it was quite remarkable. We had folks from Vietnam, Cambodia, you know, Thailand, Sri Lanka, folks from Japanese, Korean, and Chinese sects, and the allies as well who were non Asian. And this was the traditional sort of 49 day memorial or funeral service that happens in, in Buddhist traditions. And it was really just a way for, um, for our whole Sangha or community to come together and express our grief and also how we're going to knit together to move forward uh, and what, what Buddhism in particular, but I think any religious affiliation and that sense of community and spirituality can, what it can offer as we try to find a path forward. But, it was very moving and um, it wasn't, a, it was focusing on the Atlanta shootings, but also recognized and memorialized the various Asian American or Asian Buddhists who have been victims of anti-Asian violence and hate since Asians have been in the United States or been in North America. And so it was, it was very deeply moving and I was really grateful to be a part of it. And it's been amazing that it's, um, gotten some really good coverage. It was even in the New York Times yesterday, which was really great. Um, you know, I mean, Serena, I want to touch upon kind of like maybe, uh, the fact that, you know, there's the perception, you know, that, you know, Hawaii, again, it's in the middle of the Pacific. It's so much sheltered from the rest of the world. Um, you know, like this, these things happen far away on the continent and what have you. But, um, you know, I think it's like, um, you know, but these are, you know, I think, uh, you know, systemic racism, you know, all these, you know, there's, there's always, yes, there are, you know, maybe, maybe not as, um, they're, I would say not, they're just as prevalent in Hawaii, but just, just different, you know, they're, they're unique, unique issues, right? And then maybe Mary, you can, you can touch upon, because your, 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 your work is in, in the API, you know, the diaspora, and then, they, you, know, you know, especially in the Asian American and Pacific Islander, uh, when there's like you know with the pandemic with this reckoning of uh, and like of like you know basically um you know anywhere from, there's lots you know can of, whole can of worms when it comes to you know um native rights you know it comes to you know um us as, as Asian, me as an asian american or me born and raised in hawaii as a you know a settler to hawaii really just identifying that you know being um mary can you maybe talk about kind of the different you know issues that are, are explored in hawaii but may, that are maybe different from the rest of the US, but are still very similar. Yeah, there's a lot of different topics that you covered. Yeah, in, yeah, yeah, yeah. Question, because I, I was thinking at first, are you going to ask Serena the question? So I kind of pivoted over. So yeah. I apologize if I didn't grasp all of it. Uh -huh. But I think, you know, in terms of, I want to piggyback off what Serena and Christina were talking about. I think, first of all, thank you so much for all the work that you're doing. It is so important. And Christina, I did see you in April when you were speaking here on the Capitol as well. And the experiences of Asian American kids today, and especially in schools, as Serena talked about, the bullying and the things that are, uh, that are experienced um, has been ongoing. So these, these are not new phenomenons, right? This um, anti-immigrant sentiment is not a new phenomenon from the time that we've had Asian Americans here to the biggest cases, Vincent Chin, and then all these other you know, hate crimes that we've seen recently. What I'm concerned about, it's a little bit off what you're asking, Anderson. What I'm actually con concerned about as folks were talking is that I really hope that Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders do not only respond when it's an attack on Asian Americans. Yeah. Yeah. That is a huge mistake because we, we sit on the shoulders of the struggles of our black brothers and sisters during the civil rights and the third world liberation movement, the indigenous communities, the Chicano Latino communities. Now more than ever, we really have to build coalitions. Um, Serena, I'm also part Japanese and Korean, and I think most of us are beautifully blended, right? But the reality that we're othered, um, you know, it's the racialized narrative in the United States pivots communities of colors against each other. And I think this incident that's happening with um, 
you know, Chauvin verdict, as well as the anti-Asian against elders and young children, the most vulnerable of those, I think is really beyond ignorance. It's really about fear. For whatever reason, we need reflectiveness and mindfulness and the, the teachings of Zen and Buddhist teaching now more than ever, because it is fear. It is the fear of not having what's, what they feel is rightfully theirs. Um, as Audre Lorde talked about the notion of scar the scar scarcity mount mindset, that somehow that we have to hoard whatever the piece of the pie because it's not gonna be enough for everyone as opposed to thinking we can all have something and we can all you know, be complete and full. It, it is fear and it's, and it's combined with um, the terrorist narratives that are out there that people easily buy into. So I so appreciate the work of the theater group and also of the, the Zen and Buddhist teaching because we really have to ground people right now about what is it that's fueling this hate? What is it that's fueling racism? And to give it a pass by saying mental illness or ignorance or family upbringing is not addressing the systematic and institutional racism that exists in our society. And so in my own work, um, as I was the past president of the Association for Asian American Studies, and we have so many academics and researchers who are doing applied work, but I think we really need to work together. It's not just academics in their silos, not community folks in their silos or the business or nonprofit folks in their silos. We have to come together. And I think that's what's beautiful about what's happening today. It's horrible of the hate, but the fact that we're all starting to come together and you Anderson bringing us together here is a really wonderful testament to what we actually need to do. I think we have to start to plan and strategize about moving forward and addressing and naming what's problematic as opposed to putting it on the side. Yeah, allyship and co coalition building is very, very important. And the fact that, you know, especially in in um, Western culture, you know, like um, putting together even like AAPI, they should be separate. <laughs> like, and also the fact that uh, our, our, maybe, you know, just Asian Americans, they're not a, it's not a monolith. They were, you know, we're, you know, there are many countries that represent uh, uh, Asian Americans and also many communities, also many, um, you know, and there's also, you know, issues of, of like, you know, class issues, you know, like um, colorism and all that stuff. Like, it's like, there's a lot, a lot of things to explore and like, you know, um, but like you know, for for Ned and David, like I mean, working in the Korean community uh, in Hawaii, uh, and then also your work, I'm sure you work also with um, um, with the consulate as well. Like, what is what is your in your opinion, or maybe your interactions with um, you know uh, Korean nationals, or maybe how how is the reception or the, the perspective of what's happening here here in America from a you know from a South Korean perspective in in, in Asia from the Pacific Rim. Uh, be, before I, I go there, I just want to add one more thing to Mary. Mary was talking about discrimination against, uh, particularly racist-based dis discrimination. But we've also had terrible incidents with synagogues, synagogues being attacked. Uh, we've had a lot of anti-Muslim attitudes. And I, I really hate to say, but America has a racist history. And I think you all know that. And oh, yeah. It's like, in Hawaii. Uh, that it's crazy, yeah. Yeah, I know. And if you go back even in Hawaii, we yeah. had incidents in the 20s and the 30s, the Massey case is just one example. And so Hawaii, in many respects, offers today possibly a vision for the future. But also, I think we, as, as Mary said, we need to all come together. It isn't just about my group. It's a, because my group is citizens of this country, visitors to this country. That's who our group should be. It should be everybody. Anyway, David, why don't you take his question since I just was on the platform for a second. Right, right. Um, um, when the pandemic hit, uh, our association, the Korean Association's focus was to just help out the seniors who only speak Korean and they can't have the resources. They do not have the wherewithal or family support uh, to get the necessary medical assistance and the food supplies. And we were very concerned about that. Um, and, and so we did a lot of work to support the Koreans, uh, Korean seniors in particular. But when these Asian, uh, anti-Asian hatred um, was uh, rising up, and we, we then realized that our, our focus should not be just ourselves. We have to reach out and we have to expand our horizon and we got we gotta 
connect and 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 like you said, a, a form of coalition and and, the, and and cooperation among the different ethnic groups. Because what we realize is that there there is a force that is trying to like you said pivot and and put put two groups and three groups against each other. And that is what we learned from the, uh, the Professor Ramsier's um, the article. What it did was not only um, we try to revise the history, but also uh, pivoting the Koreans and Japanese against each other. And we saw that as a, an attempt that is just trying to perpetuate uh, this racial division among different groups. So uh, as, a, as a member of the Korean Association, what we're trying to do is reach out to the different ethnic groups and see if we can work this out together and, and form a, a, a uh, strong voice against this racial hatred. Um, and, and, and living in Hawaii, uh, people will say uh, that we don't, and, and I, I personally don't experience um, the type of overt and um, explicit um, anti-Asian hatred. However, we know that there are still uh, the walls and there are still divisions among different ethnic groups. And we have stereotypes. We have make we, we have jokes and makes fun of each other groups. In Hawaii, it's not as serious as in the mainland, but we do still have some prejudice, and we do still have some stereotypes that still do separate us and divide us. So, and I think Hawaii is um, very. We are very unique, and we are live, we have a very um, a unique opportunity uh, to be an example for the rest of the country. Uh, we have uh, the ability to, um, to to really get closer with each other, and we ha we have an ability to understand the history and the past of each ethnic groups, where we've been, where we are, and we are where we are going. And uh, I think we do have the, the shared values of um, the past pain and suffering uh, through the wars and through the um, immigrant. Um, the challenges and the difficulties. So if we can find some commonality and, and have understanding um, that all we are trying to do is to provide the, you know, for the, our next generation, our families, uh, the place where we can call our home, our Ohana. And, 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 and again, come together to, to act against this uh, the Asian hatred. I think we as a Hawaiians um, have a very, uh, again, a strong opportunity and a unique a chance uh, to show the world, you know, how it is to live together in racial harmony and how it benefits everybody. So uh, as, again, as a member of the Korean Association, that's what we're trying to do. And we hope that um, the academics, the businesses and the, the, the cultural societies can come together achieve that goal um you know talk about I mean, you know when it comes to kind of institutions especially because of the pandemic and whatnot it's like allowed us to kind of re-explore basically this is an opportunity for us to actually have real change right i mean like i mean you know and things happen that come out of the way. i mean it was a news story last year you know when every every kid was homeschooled they all were all basically on zoom classes and the there was some like outsourced curriculum that was used and it was like pretty somewhat very outdated and racist, you know, and, like this is like in Hawaii, you know, like it's like, um, how do you, uh, I mean, I think, you know, with HTY, Sumer and Alvin, like, you know, and then maybe, and also with Christina, I think you're, you're using kind of um, education and awareness and using the fact, I mean, for example, you, you know, HTY obviously is a theater group, but you have to pivot to, you know, be entirely online, right? And um, and then you, you the fact that you you know witness you watched the news uh, of these Atlanta killings and you basically came together and quickly came up with the episode. Um, how do what do you how do you see kind of the kind of the challenges but also the, I would say kind of the these changes that allowed you to benefit from changing kind of flipping the script so to speak in in your, your and in what and how your content is created and produced um, and, and can be educational as well. Maybe Alvin can um, help me out after, but um, I would say, like like I said, the highway uh, came out of the pandemic, and it's 
it really talks to the moment. And it's something new because, you know, in a theater company, you would have to set up a, a whole season one year prior so you can advertise and get bookings from schools and all that. Whereas um, when, when the highway came about, I mean, our turnovers were two weeks. It was incredibly fast. It was actually super stressful at the beginning, but the benefit was that we can really talk to the moment. And what we really did was just turn to the community. So our structure in the highway, we always have a section of, I'm talking to the kids um, you know, in the community and also talking to an expert. Um, in this case, in the Talk Stronger Together episode, we, uh, we had a guest, Maya Sutoro, from, uh, who is a co-founder of Seize the Peace, wonderful lady. Um, she, st she spoke about home, um, the question that we are often asked, which is, where are you from? And sometimes it could be hurtful because some might view you as you're not from here, you know, but she talked about home and that's something, I mean, piggybacking with what David said earlier too, like home is where you feel like you belong, where you do your work, right? Where, where you think, uh, where your school is, where your friends are, right? But that the sense of community, I think, and like um, speaking to what Mary was talking about, about the fear, it's to get to know your neighbors is the first thing we need to do because your neighbors and yourself make the community where you are. And yeah, so um, something that we talk about in the Stronger Together episode, but um, Alvin, why don't you take over some? Yeah, I'll, I'll just transition that to also like in this pause, and this is happening. Um, I know it's happening a lot with a lot of artistic circles in the theater world. Um, and I'm hoping, and I'm pretty sure it's, it's I mean, it's going to filter into film as well. But um, there's all these talks going on about, okay, we can't make theater, we can take a look at what's been working or what hasn't been working. And a lot of conversations are leading into equity, diversity, and inclusion uh, across the board. And, and I feel like the arts is just one area of looking at this, but it's really everything. Earlier, Anderson, you're talking about going back to Minari. It had, a, it had an Asian producer, you know, and looking at you, you're an Asian artistic director of, of, of HIF. There's not a lot of us out there in those positions. Um, because things have not been run that way for a long time. And there hasn't been a collective consciousness of trying to actively look for equity and diversity and inclusion. Uh, and now that's got to start to change. Like artists are standing up for themselves and not allowing this to happen. But also, you know, there's a growing, I believe, and a growing desire for it to change. I mean, it's happening on Broadway right now where, you know, toxic practices by, by producers in power are being, you know, stood up to finally, you know, um, it's more, more women are standing up for their rights, you know, which needs to happen, especially in the arts world and in the film world. Um, and we need to, we need to take a look and really just look at also the positions of leadership because the all the positions of leadership should not be monotone. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, that's very, you know, like it's, uh, and also, Chris, you know, that's very, actually very um, well put. Uh, Christina, I mean, before we start, um, I just wanna just, um, you know, say that we're gonna actually open it up for questions from the, you know, um, people who are on Zoom or on Facebook, watching this on Facebook. Um, if you're on Zoom, you can enter your questions in the Q&A kind of box uh, at the bottom, and then a, a staffer from HIF can um, will will monitor that. If you're watching on Facebook, then just put your question in the comment section, and then uh, uh, a staffer from HIF will also um, you know retrieve those questions, and we can answer it to and we can I can ask it to the uh, panelists here. Christina, I mean, like you know, you you also as a Zen Buddhist, you know, you you want to have that personal interaction, you have people come to your temple, right? Like it's like, because of the pandemic, that's not possible. So, you know, I mean, and in, in, the, in a way, um, do you feel that, you know, because your your teachings or your studies that has, um, um, there's an opportunity to kind of use technology to, you know, I mean, for example, um, you wrote an article in a podcast about, you know, using uh, Buddhism as activism, right? So, um, it, um, you know, um, getting your kind of message out there, so to speak, um, uh, on the internet or what have you. So can you talk about kind of your pivot to that and how 
what do you mean exactly by having um kind of your Buddhist te teachings to to um kind of fight against uh, anti Asian racism? Yeah, the um, we definitely I I in particular and with the support of Chosen G's leadership, I'm, which I'm great, very grateful for, you know, have used online technologies and Zoom to just get out there and really talk to and connect with a lot more people. Um, but the the training that we do, the Zen training is, you know, Chosen G's particular approach is very physical and it's through the body. So it, by its nature and by necessity, it has to be done in person. But what actually we were really fortunate to be able to do was that early on in the pandemic, after lockdown, um, we were able to just have people come live here. And that's something that's always happened. Local folks who might, you know, start out coming just once a week or twice a week. They're like, you know, I've got three weeks off during from school or I'm in a transition in my life and they'll just come live up here um, and train really seriously. Usually there's a, a relationship there and they sort of know what they're getting into because it's pretty intense, much more so than people can even uh, expect or imagine a lot of the time. But that actually put us in this position to like, essentially have a quarantine bubble and operate like a household. So there were a lot of things that we were still able to do. And then just the way that um, the founder, Tanoi Roshi, really built this place, Chozenji, all the way in the back of Kalihi. We've got about two and a half acres and it's all sort of very traditional um, or reminiscent of traditional Japanese architecture where you have screens and doors that open up to the outside. So everything's super well ventilated. We can do a lot of training outdoors. So we've been very lucky that we, we never stopped training. We just kept everything going. And then, um, you know, the nice thing about Zazen or meditation is that ostensibly you're not talking and you're not expelling any droplets. So we were able to get that going pretty fast where everyone was masked and distanced and we had the, all of the windows open. Um, but we were able to restart our beginning Zazen class and the kind of, um, you know, I wouldn't say it was totally a surprise, but it was a little unexpected that that pandemic brought a lot of people out of the woodwork who kind of brushing up against and facing an existential crisis, a very real one in the form of the pandemic, were like, I need tools. I need tools to face this stuff because I have a feeling this isn't the last hard thing that I'm going to face, or I need tools just to get through today. So we've had actually a big surge in a lot of people wanting to come out and experience Zen and take a really um, a challenging approach to it. But, um, you know, I, I think when we were talking earlier, it made me uh, particularly what Alvin was saying about, you know, the uh, people's willingness and interest, I think, to diversify different sectors. I wanted to touch on that very quickly because I heard this wonderful art, uh, interview on NPR with the head writer, showrunner for Rutherford Falls, which primarily is about Native American communities. And I think the interviewer was like, how did you cut, like create a writer's room that's like at least, you know, eight out of 10 Native American writers. And it was such a straightforward response. It was like, I told the recruiter, I wanted eight on, I wanted majority Native American writers on staff. And that was it. And it just, it just takes that kind of leadership and a determination and it doesn't need to be dramatic and it's just like, just do it. Just figure out how to make it happen because certainly the people are out there and I feel like that's the moment we're coming into and it makes me so happy. And the, the growing awareness of um, diversity and equity and inclusion, I do think that like the moment that we're in too of the pushback and the blowback that we're feeling from that, from communities that have historically had privilege and been dominant, I, I think is kind of, not a necessary and not an ideal growing pain, but it feels like a growing pain. It's a totally new experience to not be in the majority anymore. It's a totally new experience to frankly be confronted with other groups, which is like what is so special about Hawaii that people can be really connected to their ancestry and where they come from and their culture and still not be foreign or other. And that's something that most white Americans actually don't have the experience of because they too, like Irish, German, Italian, Jewish, they weren't white, but they got cultured into whiteness and socialized into it at some point. And then a lot of people forgot where they came from. They don't know who their ancestors are and they're not connected to that culture. 
And I think that's part of what makes this sort of moment of Asian American awakening actually kind of threatening and why we're seeing this some of this violence because there's that visceral fear of like, I don't know what that means. I don't have that. And it's just a, it sort of thrusts people who've been very used to a particular way of living in the world into a new reality. Yeah, um, um, Mary, I get the very excellent point. Mary, you know, I mean, this is kind of like, uh, you know, the fact that, you know, the Third World Liberation Front, you know, the origins of the, you know, Asian American um, activism, you know, in, in, in coalition building with, um, uh, you know, Chicano and uh, African American um, activists as well in the 60s. I mean, you know, the, 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 you know, the social sciences or, you know, like it's like, it's always under attack <laughs> in, in academia. Like, it's like the fact that, you know, how do you, how do we kind of like flip the script when it comes to these institutions? Like the fact that, you know, a lot of, I mean, I'm just talking about because of this, this the topic of this, uh, of this panel about, you know, kind of Asian American history uh, you know, like, uh, you know, like there, there's not being taught um, at all, like, you know, like um, in schools, like, it's like, how do you, how do we flip the script regarding that? Because a lot of it is because of, of xenophobia and otherness is because of a lack of, I would assume one of the symptoms is a lack of education and regarding and, and explaining this history. Mary, you can talk about it and then Ned, you can, you can go after that, but Mary, you can go for, go for us. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, echoing a little bit of what a lot of our panelists are saying is to be unapologetic and what we need and in many ways what we demand. So for example, in California and the California State University system, which I'm a part of, I'm at Cal Poly Pomona, but the CSU system has a mandate where students have to take an ethnic studies class. Um, the K through 12, they have to take an ethnic studies class and it has to be vetted. So I'm on a you know committee where we set the criteria of who can teach these classes and what kind of classes so these are people who are actually experts as opposed to folks who are just saying, oh yeah, I can teach that. You know, like I can teach about race, sure. But these are folks who've done, who've worked in the community, who've done research, who've taught, who've mentored students of color, underserved communities. And so there's a mandate. Hawaii needs this so desperately. And I am shocked that every year that ethnic studies at UH Manoa is on the chopping block. Um, I received my PhD from ethnic, um, from sociology at UH. But ethnic studies, the department is my intellectual home. And I am, I'm appalled that in Hawaii, that people feel that we have this multicultural par paradise. But the reality is, is that there's a lot of internalized racism, the colonization and the history of colonization in Hawaii really, um, I think puts this kind of funny mirror game for folks where they don't actually see the true reflection of their position in oppressing other groups, such as the Micronesians who are coming and the, the onslaught of new immigrants that are coming to Hawaii. And I have to give a shout out to Ned, because you know I think a lot of times Ned and I have, we've known each other for a long time. I've known him since I was a grad student. And you know, we always joke that, you know, his, he speaks Korean better than I do, you know, when we're in Korea together. He has been one of um, the strong, strongest advocates and allies. And I think it's really important for folks to understand that. Yes, we want to build a community, but the community also includes allies and people who've been opening the doors for us, right? And, and I think Ned has opened the doors for me many times um, in his own ways and never really telling me, but I know Ned's behind it. And I think that's what I try to do for other folks as well as a full professor, as a director of two you know, institutes on campus. I try to open doors, but the reality is we have to name what it is. And we have to call it for what it is, because without it, we're going to just kind of keep going back. Um, as I think, you know, as Alvin mentioned, this is not a new thing, you know, anti-Asian hate, um, anti-immigrant sentence, it's not new. But we have to confront, you know, where it's coming from, call it for what it is, and be unapologetic and demand ethnic studies in the curriculum. Demand it from K through 12, demand it in the arts because representation matters, but history and truth also matters and science matters. And so Hawaii has some work to do as well. I mean, this multicultural paradise myth is like the model minority myth, right? We are not your model minority and I'm not your dragon lady either, right? And I'm not your perpetual foreigner. So we really have to call it for what it is. And uh, Julia Wang, a CEO at Intertrend Communications, shout out to her because she's phenomenal. Started, yeah, I love Julia. yeah, she made this make noise campaign, but she, did this print of teacher saying narrative plenitude because for Asian Americans, we don't have one story. We have so many stories. Let's tell all these stories. Just because Minari was 
nominated this year, it doesn't mean we can't nominate more Asian American films next year, right? Mm -hmm. and, and just because the lead actress in Hades Town is Pinai, doesn't mean we can't have more Pinai. It's not just Leah Salanga. And you know, it's like, come on, we can have so many. Um, and my last word before Ned says it, when we hire an academia, this is the biggest pet peeve for me. We already have one Korean specialist. We, have, we already have one Korean American. We don't need any more. You never hear this when you have a white applicant doing history of British literature. We already have one of those, right? So we need to change the narrative and be unapologetic and demanding what, what is rightfully should be for our communities to reflect who we are as a nation. Ned, you want to say anything? Hey, thanks. I don't want to sound like an echo, but I, Mary and I do tend to think an awful lot alike. Um, for prior to this, I was just trying to think, what can we do? I mean, how can we change this narrative? And I think all of you have given some really great suggestions on, on, on way to, the way to move forward. And I wanted to just talk a little bit more about education because that's sort of my background. And as Mary said, it's a mixed picture for the University of Hawaii. We do have what's called the HAPS course, a Hawaiian Asian Pacific course that we require all students to take at one time or another. We do try to push world civilizations, but I think one way to fight this ongoing racism is to get everybody, not just people in California, not just people in Hawaii, to know about the past of other countries, not just pure white America. And I think that's, that's, that's an important asset. Education can begin to solve things. The other thing I just wanted to mention is politics. Now in Hawaii, we don't really have much of a problem with our politicians. Well, we're not, not a great problem with the politicians. They, they understand the importance of AAPI. But in the mainland, there's a lot of other, other states that don't understand and don't give a damn. And I think we need to try to make this a political issue too. Uh, if you're in Wyoming, Go to, go to that woman Cheney and say, hey, you got to speak up for Asian, Asian, Asian Pacific Americans, uh, you know, and, and, and basically make it also politics, because that's when people begin to, to understand. Anyway, I know you're running out of time, so I'll, I'll stop here, but getting in, thanks a lot. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, Mary, you, you, you talked about like the narrative plenitude, like, you know, and I think Viet Thanh Nguyen, uh, you know, Pulitzer Prize winning author of the, the um, the, the, the sympathizer, he talked about Asian plenitude, you know, the fact that, you know, there should be, I mean, every, every, every major Asian American film and Asian film should not necessarily be Oscar nominated award winning films, you know, we should have a lot of, a lot of, I mean, we should have plenitude when it comes to anything, anywhere from like music to lifetime movies to romance novels, you name it, you know, it's just like, uh, I think that's, that's the, you know, that's kind of like what would be, um, you know, the plenitude, you know, helps shape kind of perceptions of what how Asians are not 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 othered, so to speak. Um, I think we're getting some questions from the audience. Um, I think uh, Christina already answered one. Uh, and then there's one from Nora Onishi. Do you think being an island state or community is what makes people in Hawaii embrace and respect the diversity more readily? It is, it is, is it our island community, unlike the many megalopolis that we are see on the mainland, reduce feelings of anonymity and keeps the violent prejudicial behavior in check? Well, that's, I don't, I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> I think it's, maybe it's just the fact that it's, uh, uh, that it's an island state, you know, like it's community um, and maybe because of the, the multicultural makeup of the Hawaii that we, um, um, how is it compared to kind of like, um, of these issues that are, that are in the mainland. I think we kind of answered that already. Um, you know, um, keeping away from the enemy, keeping away from the violent prejudicial behavior. Um, I don't know if anyone can answer that. Well, we kind of talked about yeah. space, right? Like we mm -hmm. just don't have as much space here. Yes, we still have neighborhoods, but like if you, if you look at the continent, there's just so much more space and, and you don't have to see certain people if you don't want to and i feel like in hawaii it's it's inevitable it's in you know if you you go to school and you're gonna see people who look different from you and probably bring a different kind of home lunch than you brought <laughs> and um at least for me that that has always been a a good part of growing up here i, I did want to add though you know i think in hawaii um what is beautiful is you know the the diversity and the multi-ethnicness of so many of us. But I think the also thing that we haven't really talked about is the economic disparity that exists in, in Hawaii. And 
Hawaii has the number one homeless population in the nation. There is There are sides where people are not humanized in Hawaii as well. And largely indigenous Pacific Islanders are the ones who are disproportionately disadvantaged in Hawaii. And this is something that I think despite all the tourist pictures and so forth, the hidden side of Hawaii's reality is that people are being displaced on the island and there is a massive brain drain where there are uh, local kids who become educated on, in the continent or even Hawaii to find jobs move. Um, I know personally friends and family who have moved to Colorado, to Georgia, Atlanta, you know, other parts. And if you think about North Dakota, I believe is the fastest growing Asian American community in the nation yeah, that, that. <laughs> yeah, people are looking for affordable places to live from Hawaii, but also as places in California and New York and elsewhere. So Minari is actually quite timely in the staging of Oklahoma, where you have a very few number of a small one Asian American family in this very small town. We are seeing, we are going to be seeing that all around the nation. And that's why it's so important to have this educational component. In Hawaii also, we're gonna see a major transplant emergence. I'm so glad they stopped Airbnb, Not, nothing against Airbnb, but we need to have rent control you know, in Hawaii. And the reality is that people cannot afford to live in Hawaii. So the, they're leaving to places like Texas or Arizona or Vegas or you know, North Dakota, and other people are buying out Hawaii. Look at all the high rises, look at, the efforts to turn country into a city. And I love the country activism, keep country country. So I think that those are some of the things that folks have to be mindful of. In Hawaii, come as a visitor, as a respectful person, because I think, I hope we never lose that in Hawaii, where I'm not from Hawaii, but I feel it's my adopted home. And I, I hope that people maintain the respect for our elders, respect for our community. I think food alone does not define respect. Right. We don't yeah. want to commercialize right. appropriate yeah. culture in that way. There's and, a sign or a saying saying like you love us like you love our food. I was like, come on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's so I think we have to really call it for what it is. And also in Hawaii, point out the areas that we need to work on, because there's a lot to work on. And the economic disparity, poverty is a huge, huge thing um, that we need to address. We are very privileged. Right. If you have a shelter and you have home, you have to eat. But I think going back to Minati and what the filmmakers have talked about in Oklahoma, I think those are those are those kinds of experiences are going to pop up on a daily basis, and so we really have a lot of work to do. Yeah, I think uh, this is a great. Um, we have one final. I think mean, we have a question from Facebook. I think this is a great way to to end this conversation. Uh, Keone from Facebook writes: As a non-Asian person, what is one or two things can I? I can, can I do today to help become a better ally for my uh, Asian American peers? I think what um, Mary, you talked about Ned was beautiful. Um, you don't have to be a certain ethnicity to, I think, be friends with or rep, uh, represent in a beautiful way a, a certain culture. You can study, you can you can go there and yeah, study or implant yourself in the culture. I think there's no, I, I would say humans are one race. We're all in this together and yeah, make, make friends and be an upstander if you see something, if you see someone who's being bullied or, you know, I'm assuming this is a child. Uh, sorry, I, I, it's in no, my no, HTY. That's an, that's an adult, I think. <laughs> okay, okay. I'm in my yeah, HTY yeah. mode yeah, talking yeah. to children. <laughs> but if there are children, same thing. But I yeah. think, yeah, um, being an ally means being friends, standing up for your friends. So I think that's one way to, to stand up. Yeah, I mean, oh. a lot. Go ahead, Mary. I was going to just mention that Asian American Advancing Justice has this bystander training that yes. we're also doing coalition with the Asian American Anti Squad, who are awesome, led by Christina Wong, and a lot of um, amazing aunties who've been doing things to fight the um, you respond to the pandemic as well as you know respond to the anti Asian hate. So I would really encourage folks that you know attend these kinds of training, as you know Serena's pointed out, become educated, be informed. One of the things try not to do is to ask people to explain everything to you because many of us are really tired, you know, and, you know, it's it please try to find um, get some basic information, go to these trainings, go to the workshops, they're open to everyone. They're everywhere. And I think um, probably Anderson will probably be able to provide some link through this film festival later on as well. 
but I, that's what I would do. And then I love your uh, point, Serena, of making friends and building relationships. I mean, I think I, I've known Ned for over, you know, 25 years and it's, it's a long time. And, and it's, I don't say nice things about him because I've known him for 25 years. I've known a lot of people for that long and I don't talk to them or I wouldn't say those things, but I think you have to walk the talk and you have to be consistent. And I think if you truly are, you know, I, I believe that you're genuine in what you're saying is that it's one time of feeding the homeless at a food, uh, food shelter. Thanks, Thanksgiving is not enough, right? It has to be a consistent um, investment in doing this work. And it's exhausting. So find your community because you'll be tired, you know, because we all get exhausted too. I try to meditate and show gratitude every day, you know, and that's one way that I try to find some semblance of whew, healing. Yeah, everyone should do that. <laughs> should meditate. Um, I just to build on what Serena and Mary were saying. The things that you do are obviously important, but focusing on the quality of who you are is also really critical. And that means, you know, what are you doing to challenge yourself so that when you're in uncomfortable situations, you're in a situation that feels foreign or strange, or where you feel isolated, that you don't fall into habits of you know, isolating yourself further through feeling yourself as other or different, that you don't project some of your own fears and anxieties onto other people. And that we all really acknowledge that, you know, from a Buddhist and from other standpoints, even down to, you know, physics, quantum physics, like, I'm going to sound super hippie if I say we're all vibration, but, <laughs> but it's true. <laughs> and, you know, the, the easy way to understand that is that if I feel really tense, chances are the person next to me is going to feel really tense too. They're going to pick up on it. And so there are so many things that we can do just to improve ourselves and to just make sure we, the person that we are is a lot closer to the person that we want to be, that they become the same thing. And then, you know, if our ideal and our goal is to be able to do that, show up that way in every encounter that we have, then we're definitely going to make an impact on this issue and on any other issue that arises. David, you want to say I'm something? Suggest, yeah, I would suggest to uh, people like Keone uh, to learn, read upon and learn about the history of different groups, different ethnic groups. Uh, I would suggest, you know, read upon the modern history a pick a topic of whoever, um, whichever group that you wanna, you have interest in. I'm not an educator, but I think reading upon uh, a certain groups of past history uh, will really benefit and, and, and improve your understanding of the current status and profile of uh, the different um, ethnic groups. So I, I would suggest that, and it certainly did help me in understanding and uh, improving my, um, you know, sort of the diverse uh, point of view uh, in dealing with different uh, minority groups here in Hawaii. Yeah, and then, uh, you know, and I think it's a lot of it's uh, stemming from education, the fact that, you know, there's a movement to quote unquote whitewash American history, you know, we, you know, you know, like, like, like that said, like, you know, um, the roots of, 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 of this nation are rooted in racism. And, you know, there are a lot of atrocities, especially in Hawaii too. Um, you know, and these, these are things that are not being taught, you know, and not, not in textbooks. And, uh, um, you know, so I think it's like, you know, just to, to basically learn from what we, how we came to be and not repeat. I mean, it's as simple as that. It's to not repeat those, you know, and, and, and have empathy regarding that, you know, and, uh, um, you know, so, and I think hopefully, you know, I mean, you know, there's obviously, I mean, you know, with the pandemic and what have you, just, there was a lot of, a lot of, um, moments to kind of reflect and, you know, coalition build and hopefully, you know, we become stronger from that, but it's, it's always a constant battle. And, um, and, uh, you know, again, I, I want to say thank you again for, for participating in this panel. Um, you know, Minari is a very special film to, to not only the festival, but I'm sure for many of you and also for the, not the Asian American community, but American, the American uh, film, film community as well. Um, and um, so I keep, keep doing what you do, um, continue the great work. We will probably uh, definitely put in some links in our kind of social media regarding um, kind of like the handbook when it comes to what, what Mary was talking about through um, uh, Asian Americans Advancing Justice and whatnot. So we'll, we'll get that and, you know, just go to our, our social media 
um, sites to 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 get all that more more of that information. Um, is there anyone else? Um, and also keep watching hip movies from an anonymous attendee, <laughs> as you know we show films from all the world. So. Yeah, Mary, you wanted to say something? I was going to say, and please continue to uh, support the Hawaii International Film Festival, support the arts, you know, the youth theater groups, support mil movies that are made by Asian American, Pacific Islander, um, communities of color, you know, go to the film, spend your money in businesses. I mean, those are some of the ways that you can also help, but um, to the work that everyone is doing. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, and uh, that, you know, that's a great segue for my plug for the festival. Uh, we have these... Uh, uh, mini festivals happening all virtually. J Fest is happening this month, and uh, we have um, uh, Eat Drink Film uh, next month. And in July, we have the French Festival of Viva Le Cinema, and also our big show, the 41st annual Hawaii International Film Festival presented by Holly Kalani, is uh, going to be in November. So we we plan to be hi a hybrid event, you know, virtually in theaters and perhaps drive-ins as well. So um, thank you again. Um, thank you to David, Mary. Ned, Alvin, Serena, and Christina for joining us today in this uh, special panel. And also thank you to Council Park and uh, the, uh, the consulate, um, the consulate for uh, the Korean consulate for uh, of Honolulu for for um, you know um, participating and presenting co-presenting this panel and uh, and also the Minari screening. So um, thank you again, and then uh, we'll see you at the movies and see you soon. Bye bye. <laughs>